So we're doing our best to accommodate everyone, um, and we may, we may not have quite enough chairs, which is testimony to the interest of all of us in this project and your dedication in trying to find out information. Uh, I'd like to welcome you here this morning uh, to this session, this information session for HR design. My name is Harry Webney Behrman. Uh, I am uh, privileged to be the team lead for the collaboration team uh, within this project. And the collaboration team's role has been to advise project leadership throughout and serve as a resource for making sure that all of us as a community are meaningfully engaged in conversation, information flow around the HR design as the project has been conceived and now as we're moving forward towards developing specific details of its implementation and then training related to that implementation. This morning's session is also being live streamed and video captured and thanks to folks at UW Extension. Uh, we are uh, going to then make that video as well as the handout uh, available online on the HR Design website. So those types of materials are available for everyone in including folks who weren't able to make it here today. There is another session tomorrow afternoon uh, that will be at Gordon Commons, uh, and that will also be open to staff at 1.30 p.m. tomorrow afternoon. And then there will be a third session on Wednesday night, March 13th, at 11 p.m. at the uh, Health Sciences Learning Center that is particularly intended to uh, make this information available to second and third shift staff. Uh, all of these sessions are also being simultaneously provided in other rooms within this building in Union South, uh, being offered in Spanish, Tibetan, Hmong, and Chinese. And materials are being made available in those languages as well. So it is a value of this project that the information be made accessible and available to people throughout the project. We will be having updates uh, on a quarterly basis we're, as we're going forward, as well as trying to make sure that we're reaching out to specific groups of staff and faculty and students so that the whole UW community is aware of these important changes in our HR system. The session this morning will be divided into two parts. In a moment, I'll be introducing Bob Lavinia, the director of the Office of Human Resources, who will be providing information to you about where we are in the project and where we plan to be going as we're going forward these next few months. In the second half of the conversation, uh, we will be taking questions from people. As you entered the room, we were providing index cards as a way to make sure that we're able to track all of the questions and comments. Uh, we will also be available to distribute more of those cards. But we want to make sure that we're tracking those from everyone, whether you get to directly ask a question or not. We also have microphones, so we'll be taking questions uh, that come both from the cards and from, uh, from the audience and through microphones. Uh, so members of our team will be collecting those cards uh, late in Bob's presentation and then identifying some questions that seem to be coming up as themes so that we can be sure we're addressing those within the time we have this morning. So without any further delay, I, I guess there's one more thing I just want to mention, and we've been trying to say this consistently throughout the project. It is a value of this project that we include people's opinions, that we welcome everybody's participation, and that we try to do so as a community really trying to understand all the different perspectives that exist within this community about how these changes affect us. Towards that end, I ask again, and I know people have been doing a really fine job of this, Let's just try to listen to each other as respectfully and fully as we can over this next hour and a half. Let's make sure that we're framing questions and comments in a way that they can be heard and that we can respond to them. Uh, it is not my intention to uh, really support a conversation in which there's much more debate and heat rather than discussion and understanding. So just want to say that right up front. People have done a great job of participating over the last 15 months, and I'm looking forward to this session with all of you. With that, Bob Lavinia. Thanks, Harry. Good morning, everyone. Right, let's try that again. Good morning. Right, and, and thank you for being here today. I want to thank you for that, as Harry did. But more importantly, I want to thank you for the work that you do on behalf of this university. UW-Madison is a world-class university, 
because of the work that you and your colleagues do across this campus day in and day out. And, and we don't say that often enough, so I want to take this opportunity today to say thank you. Um, we are going to provide you over the next 45 or 50 minutes or so with an update on where we are in the HR design project. About a year and a half ago when we started this project, we said this was and is an extraordinary opportunity to create a personnel and human resources system designed specifically for the needs of UW-Madison. So it's an extraordinary opportunity, but it's also an extraordinary challenge because when we started this project, we knew we had a lot of work to do. We've, we've gotten a lot of that work done, but we still have a lot more to do, particularly between now and July 1st, 2013, when we need to begin implementing the new HR system and processes. So we had a series of forums uh, and other events last spring and last fall. How many of you attended um, one or more of those sessions? Okay, so a lot of people. I am going to do a little bit of background this morning, but only to provide some, some context. Uh, I really want to focus on what the status is right now and what needs to get done between now and July 1st and even after July 1st. So what are we going to talk about? Talk a little bit about background and history, again, to provide some context, make sure that all of us are sort of on the same page. Talk about the key components of the new HR design system, taken largely from the HR design strategic plan, which we discussed with the campus in detail and at length last fall. Talk about project, project strategy. How are we proceeding right now and how will we be proceeding over the next several months and even beyond? Current status in each of the specific HR areas, what we need to, to have in place by July 1st, 2013, and then what we will put in place after July 1st. As we laid out in the HR design strategic plan, because of the scope and impact of the new personnel system that we are designing, we will put it in place over a multi-year period. So there are certain things by law we have to have in place by July 1st, 2013, because as of June 30th, we will no longer be in the state government personnel system. So we need to, starting on July 1st, be able to hire people, be able to pay people, be able to advance people, et cetera. But there are other aspects of the HR design strategic plan that we'll put in place over time after July 1st, and we'll provide an opportunity, as Harry suggested, um, for questions. I'm accompanied um, by several folks who have worked and continue to work on the HR design project, including Mark Walters and Steve Lund, who will help me answer the questions, especially the hard questions. <laughs> so background and history. Biennial budget, not the biennial budget that we're about to um, get starting on July 1st, 2013, but the biennial budget uh, two years ago, we were given UW-Madison the authority to create our own tailored to our needs HR system. At the same time UW-Madison got that authority, UW system also got similar authority. So as of July 1st, 2013, there will be a personnel system for us here on this campus, as well as a separate personnel system for the other UW system campuses. We kicked the project off late um, in 2013, I'm, I'm sorry, 2011, about a year and a half ago. We formed 11 work teams that spent several months analyzing their individual HR areas. In the spring of 2012, they made a series of recommendations, draft recommendations. We presented them to the campus. We had a series of forums. We had about 50 events to collect feedback from the campus community, all of our stakeholders, and then the work teams revised their draft recommendations, which again were presented to the campus. Then the project team spent most of last summer integrating those recommendations into the HR design strategic plan, which we then presented to the campus early in the fall of 2012, September. Governance approved the revised strategic plan late in 2012, we went individually to each one of, <clears throat> excuse me, the governance groups, made presentations, got feedback, had conversations about the HR design strategic plan, and then each of the governance groups um, individually voted 
to accept the HR design strategic plan after we made some changes as a result of those conversations. So this is, this is a work in progress, continues to be a work in progress. Then the Board of Regents, this was obviously a big step, approved the policies, UW-Madison, as well as the UW system policies in December of 2012. So as I said, that was a big step for us to go to the Board of Regents and get its approval of our plan as well as the system plan. And then we also will need approval of the Joint Committee on Employment Relations, which will occur, as you see, sometime um, this spring in anticipation of the July 1st kickoff of the new HR system. So that's a, a quick trip through the history of this project and where we are now. There were some key components <clears throat> that the HR design strategic plan individually identified, and, and the order of your handouts is a little different because I made a switch this morning, but you do have the slide. So the HR design strategic plan addressed employee categories, compensation, and job titles. We've said many times as we have rolled the strategic plan out to the campus that we have around 1,600 job titles, <clears throat> and many of them have a single incumbent. We created new titles because we wanted to do something else, like pay people more money. So we need to address the compensation and job title issues. Job security, even though we are moving to a new system, by law, that system has to have the same safeguards in terms of job security that we have right now under the, um, the law and the rules that are promulgated by the Office of State Employment Relations. Employee benefits, uh, a big issue. We are still going to be in the state government retirement and health insurance systems, income continuation, a couple of other important programs, and, and that's a very good thing for our employees. But there are also some areas in benefits that we can make some changes, and we'll talk about those in a moment. Recruitment selection, employee movement. We need to develop our own hiring process since we will no longer be in the state government process. It still has to be a civil service-based process with fair and open competition, and those components are being built into the new system. Diversity, inclusion, and employee engagement, um, three areas that we had individual teams addressing and then fostering and managing talent. So those are sort of the rolled up areas that map directly to the 11 work teams. The, the work teams started out <clears throat> by learning about the personnel and HR system. I think many of them, many of the members of the work teams, which included around 150 uh, people representing all of our stakeholder groups, I think they were a little surprised at how much there was to learn about our personnel and HR system. And in part, that's because we don't have one single system. We have separate systems, for example, for unclassified employees, for classified employees, and even our trades folks. We have a separate compensation benefits program. So we have multiple systems. And the work teams needed to learn about those systems and how they operate. Then they needed to take a look at how those systems are operating, what we want to achieve, where we are now, and how we need to achieve the vision of the HR design and what steps we need to take to achieve that vision over time. So they identified several areas that had some critical issues that the work team recommendations and then the HR design strategic plan are designed to address. One of them is two separate personnel systems. I mentioned that. If you include the trades, compensation, and benefits system, we actually have three separate systems. The HR design strategic plan addresses that issue by linking employee categories to exempt and non-exempt positions. That is, those employees who are, based, uh, who are paid on an hourly basis versus those who are paid on a salary basis to eliminate a lot of the overlap and confusion between who is in the classified service and who is in the unclassified service. Creating greater consistency in policies and practices across those two employment categories. Ultimately, we'd like to have a single personnel system on this campus, but we can't do that at one time. So we need to do that incrementally, and policies and practices need to be changed. Conducted a job title and total compensation um, analysis. So we, we have good data on what we need to do to be able to continue to attract, develop, and retain talent. And we eliminate a lot of the confusion about our 1,600 uh, job title system. Another issue, out-of-date job titles and inflexible pay structures. 
These are issues because we're not in a position <clears throat> to classify our employees in the way that we should be able to classify employees, to also, to in, in, in particular, give them opportunities to advance, and we don't have a lot of compensation flexibility. So the, the HR design strategic plan um, calls for a transitional compensation program, which we will put in place starting on July 1st, 2013, <clears throat> while we wait for the job title and total compensation study to be completed, and that will probably take at least another year. Adopt compensation approach with multiple pay mechanisms, recognizing that we have lots of different kinds of employees on this campus, and we need to have the flexibility to compensate them in different ways, whether it's across the board uh, pay increases to keep up with inflation, or market-based compensation to make sure that we are competitive for talent, or performance-based compensation to make sure that we are rewarding our exceptional performers. We need to have that kind of flexibility, and again, the, the job title and total compensation analysis. Perception of a hierarchy on this campus. This came through loud and clear when the work teams were doing their work. They classified employees um, feel that they are not equal in status to unclassified, to academic staff. Academic staff feel the same way about faculty. So, more clearly define employee categories so that we are consistently and logically putting employee job titles in the, in the categories that they belong. Provide university staff with governance. This is a critical component right now. And, and when I say university staff, that's going to be the new term for who are now classified employees. Classified employees right now do not have formal governance rights. Faculty do, um, academic staff do, students do, but not classified employees. So the plan calls for classified who, who will be known as university employees to have formal governance rights. We'll talk about that in a moment. And then conduct an employee engagement and inclusion survey campus-wide on a regular basis so we understand what our employees are feeling, how they're feeling about their jobs, about their colleagues, about their managers and supervisors, and about the university and its mission. Do that on a regular basis so we're collecting data to understand what our employees are thinking and feeling. Inconsistent employee performance management and development. We found during the work team's um, work that there are some units that are doing a good job making sure that everyone understands what their role is, what the expectations are, what the responsibilities are, what their goals are. But there were other units that are not doing a very good job and people told us they're very confused about what they're supposed to be doing, what their expectations are, they're not receiving performance um, feedback, nor are they getting developmental opportunities. So, implement a consistent, perf consistent performance management policy, making sure that everyone on this campus gets feedback on how they're doing, understands what their role and expectations are, and has development opportunities, including expanding training, especially for managers and supervisors. If we're going to ask managers and supervisors to do a good job managing performance, we need to make sure that they understand what that role is and they have the knowledge and skill to do it well. Ineffective and inefficient recruitment tools, in large part because we are in the state government hiring system. That system is not always um, timely and effective, and we believe we can create a system more suited to our needs. And that's what you see there. Implement an online application and applicant tracking system because we'll no longer be in the state system and redesign recruiting processes, again, making sure that we still have a civil service system that is based on fair, open, and merit-based competition, but we think we can do that in a more timely and efficient and effective way. Need to balance workforce flexibility to give work units the flexibility they need to manage their, their work and their workforce, but at the same time making sure that we are preserving important job security provisions. Create permanent and definite appointments for university staff to make sure that they have job security starting on July 1st, 2013, similar to what they have now. Maintain just cause and due process for current and future staff. We don't want to become an at-will employer. That is not part of our culture. That's not what we want to do. So there will still be in place just cause and due process provisions for our employees to make sure that employment decisions are not made in an arbitrary fashion. And we made the decision 
on our own to apply this to employees who were hired after July 1, 2013. The law doesn't require that, but because it's such an important principle on this campus, the HR design plan calls for us to retain those protections, not only for employees who are with us now, but for employees we hire in the future. The plan calls for eliminating the right of return as a mandatory provision so that right now employees who transfer voluntarily have the right to return to their jobs even if they fail probation for six months. We are, uh, are going to make that a voluntary but not a mandatory provision and modify the layoff process. Seniority will still be the primary consideration, the default for making layoff decisions, but if a work unit wants to include other factors in determining who is um, going to be laid off, they'll come to the Office of Human Resources, they will make that argument, and we will approve or disapprove that. And limited data to inform decisions. We need some metrics around diversity. I'll talk about diversity in a minute. We are going to be creating an HR dashboard that will enable us to evaluate the extent to which this new HR system is enabling us to attract, develop, and retain talent. The online application and applicant tracking system will give us data that we don't have right now on who's applying for our jobs, and the title and total compensation study will give us real-time data on what we need to do, where we need to be in terms of compensation to make sure that we can attract and retain talent. So that's a very quick trip through the HR strategic design plan, which is still on the hrdesign.wisc.edu website, and I encourage you to, to take a look at it. So this is our overall strategy um, moving forward. We've developed a set of HR program broad policies. These are the policies that um, we took to the Board of Regents. We worked with um, our governance groups, shared the draft policies with them. There are 10 of them right now got feedback from the governance groups, made some adjustments. Essentially what these policies do is replicate what's in the HR strategic design plan as well as some of the material, the provisions that are in the law that gives us um, the authority. And these draft policies are also on our website if you'd like to take a look at them. Set priorities for July 1st implementation. I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. I, I, mentioned earlier a few of the things that we absolutely have to have in place on July 1st. Develop draft operating policies. We've got the first bullet, these broad program policies, but now we're digging in and doing the detailed design, policies, procedures, and processes with subject matter experts, um, primarily folks who are in HR across, of our, cam across our campus because these are the detailed um, technical policies um, and procedures, but we will take these procedures to the governance groups as well to continue to have that conversation with our stakeholders about what this new HR system should look like. Consulting with a cross-governance committee, um, we have formed or are about to form a committee that has representatives from all of the governance groups that we will work with directly to have the conversation about the detailed design, get their input, get their feedback, make adjustments before we present the, uh, the details to the campus. So we'll continue to deal directly with the broader governance groups, but we put together this committee that has representatives from each of the governance groups because you've got a lot to do in a short period of time and we needed a group that we could work directly with. Develop training programs on new processes and procedures in areas like transitional compensation, um, recruiting and hiring, performance management. We are developing these training programs now and we'll be rolling them out in anticipation of the July 1st start. And as I mentioned, we'll be implementing this new HR system over a three-year period starting on July 1st, 2013. So that's sort of the, in broad strokes, the overall project strategy. Now I want to go through each of the areas, tell you what's going on, tell you where we are now, and explain what we're going to be doing over the next several months and beyond that. So as is included in the HR strategic design um, plan, all classified staff will become university staff. Since we're no longer in the classified service, we have developed simply a new title for those folks who are in the classified service. So on July 1st, 2013, everyone who was in uh, a classified position the day before 
will be in a university staff position on July 1st, simply a name change. Classified exempt vacancies, that is those positions in the classified service that are paid on a, um, uh, not on an hourly basis, but on a salary basis, as those positions become vacant, we will move them into academic staff beginning on July 1st, 2013. However, those people who are, as of July 1st, 2013, in those positions will have the opportunity to choose whether or not they want to stay in the university staff or they want to move into the academic staff. And we will make sure that everyone who is in that situation understands that they're in that situation. And, and one of the things we learned during the course of this project is there's a lot of confusion about, uh, uh, about whether or not I'm, in, I'm classified, whether or not I'm exempt, non-exempt. We're going to make sure everybody understands exactly where they are and exactly what their options are. We'll provide individual counseling to make sure that everyone understands if they do make the switch from university staff to academic staff, what that means for them in terms of things like how often they get paid, leave accruals, will, as I said, provide individual counseling and then provide everyone with an opportunity to make the switch. But if, if an employee chooses not to make the switch, that's fine. They can spend the rest of their careers as a university staff member, even though they are eligible to moving to academic staff. And then when that position becomes vacant, we'll move it into university staff. That choice process will not start on July 1st, 2013. We're identifying the fall of 2013 because we've got a lot of work to do. We need to make sure that we are in a position to individually counsel every employee who is in that position, who wants that counseling, so they are in the best possible position to make a choice. So that choice will not occur on July 1st, 2013. That process will occur after as we roll this, this uh, new system out. Developing information materials, as I mentioned, counseling strategy. We're also creating university staff governance. Um, we are about to appoint uh, an executive committee that will develop and put in place the process for creating university staff um, governance. There are going to be nine members of this um, executive committee, uh, uh, including um, members uh, from organized uh, labor, uh, our labor partners, uh, classified um, non-represented staff. Um, so we try to include all of our stakeholder groups um, who will have uh, an important role in developing this new university staff governance, which will include some sort of election. That's what the executive committee is going to do, put in place the process for that election and then conduct that election. We hope that university staff governance will be in place no later than July 1st, 2013, and we hope sooner than that because there are several things, and I'll show you those in a minute, that we want to work with this new university staff governance process um, or structure with to put in place. University staff governance. So, appoint the advisory committee. I mentioned that. We'll do that this month. Nine members, majority recommended by the um, CNCS and the Labor Management Advisory Committee. They are going to design and um, implement the election process. We will also work with them on the design of the HR system so that they can advise us and we can collaborate with this group as we develop the, uh, the detailed structures. This is a very important process for us and for the classified staff to make sure that this university staff governance structure is in place as soon as possible. Uh, this is the university staff uh, executive committee uh, in the spring, create bylaws, districts, election process for governing body, and also advise on the HR design project. So, first an advisory committee, and then the university staff um, executive committee, which will be elected, and they will design and put in place the process for representation across the classified staff. So, again, this is a several step process. We've done this before, for example, with academic staff, so we have a little bit uh, of history, but we will be helping the um, advisory committee put in place this process. Compensation job titles, developing this transitional compensation structure that will go into effect on July 1st, 2013. In many respects, it'll look, look a lot like the current compensation structure. The HR strategic design plan calls for a short-term and a long-term set of 
processes and practices. The short term will be the transitional compensation structure in place on July 1st, and then the longer term will be developed through the total compensation study that will uh, occur after July 1st. So this tr transitional structure, we're really going to adopt the current classified staff pay schedules and ranges, but we're going to add some flexibility so that we can bring people in to the university and not have to um, be limited to just hiring them at the minimum. We're also going to introduce some ways like the, um, the current uh, discretionary merit compensation process, which is run by state government, so that as of July 1st, 2013, we have the same kind of process here run by the university. And we want to make pay adjustment methods consistent across employment groups. Right now, there are certain things we can do in terms of base building and bonuses in some employee groups, but not all. We want to make sure that every employee um, has the same kinds of opportunities for pay raises and bonuses, and we're not limited just to certain approaches for certain employment groups. Also seeking statutory authority for performance uh, increases. Right now we can't do that um, for faculty and as part of making sure that we have the same processes for all of our employment employee groups, we are seeking this authority from the, um, the legislature as part of the biennial budget. And then we also need to identify the academic titles that we want to move from classified into academic staff. Some of those titles that are occupied by classified employees who will move into the academic staff don't exist on the unclassified side, so we have to create them. One example is, is chemist. So again, compensation job titles, short term, transitional compensation structure, which will be put in place on July 1st, 2013, that will give us more flexibility and begin the process of making sure that our compensation um, approaches are consistent across all of our employee groups and then longer term the total compensation study. Job security. Identifying um, temporary employee parameters, LTE, we have to create our own temporary employment uh, structure as of July 1st, 2013. It, it, it may look a lot like the current state government LTE process, but that's part of what we need to develop between now and July 1st, 2013. How many hours an LTE can work, over what period of time, et cetera. Um, we have to make those decisions for the university. Developing a draft grievance policy because, again, on July 1st, 2013, the current grievance policy won't apply to us anymore. We have to come up with our own. It will allow um, uh, an employee to bring a personal representative and it will include an impartial hearing officer as part of the process. Draft layoff policy defining the operational unit for each position, not only as we bring new employees into the university, letting them know what the operational unit is for layoff, but also making sure that every one of our current employees knows and understands what operational unit they are in should a layoff need to occur. And then identifying criteria for exceptions to seniority. As I mentioned earlier, seniority will still be the number one criterion the number one criterion for determining if we need to have a layoff, who gets laid off, but we are also introducing some additional flexibility and we need to develop the criteria and make sure that everyone across the campus understands under which conditions we can deviate from seniority in terms of layoffs. Employee benefits. There are some quick wins, you see them up here. As I mentioned earlier, we're still going to be in the Wisconsin retirement system, the health insurance system, the income continuation insurance system, life insurance system, and those are all good things. Um, but we are going to be making some changes to our benefits system. These are some of the things that we believe we can do in the short term. Uh, combining classified and unclassified catastrophic leave programs. Right now, we have separate programs for classified and unclassified staff, so if a classified employee wants to donate leave to an unclassified employee who has a severe need, they can't do that. We haven't been able to figure out why not, so we're going to fix it. Allowing university staff to take vacation in their first six months. Right now, classified staff cannot do that. Unclassified staff can. That creates inequity, and we're going to eliminate that prohibition so that university staff can take their vacation, just like everyone else, during their first six months. And we'll be pursuing first month pickup, the employer's share of health insurance for new university staff. Right now, there's a two-month waiting period 
and um, we want to eliminate that. We have to go through a statutory change, though, in order to provide immediate employer share of health insurance, but we think that's an important thing that we hope we can do in the short term. There may be some longer term changes. There was a lot of discussion last spring about integrating all of the benefits programs into a single benefits program, but that proved to be extremely complex. And we had a lot of conversations about, about uh, leave accruals, for example. Right now, classified and unclassified staff operate under different leave accrual schedules. The work team suggested that we integrate those schedules into a single schedule, but it created quite a bit of controversy and became quite complex and would have created the perception that there are winners and losers. Some people would be better off, other people would be worse off. So we decided that um, we did not want to try to do that in the short term. We'll include that in the, in the, uh, the total compensation and benefits study. Also, we need to, I mean, th this seems like a no-brainer, but legal holidays are identified in the state, the Office of State Employment Relations rules, so we have to identify them for ourselves. So we'll just have the same holidays, but we'll include them in our, our policies. And developing administrative mechanisms to make sure that we have a relationship with employee trust funds. Right now, we don't have that direct relationship. Um, we do that through UW system. We do that through the Office of State Employment Relations. But since we'll be on our own, we have to create that relationship with ETF to make sure that all of the benefits that our employees uh, uh, obtain through ETF continue uninterrupted. And we're beginning to create those relationships. So some stuff that we think we can do in the short term that we think will make a difference, and then longer term will include uh, a more uh, detailed and comprehensive look at benefits in the job title and total compensation study. Recruitment, selection, employee movement. Defining recruitment and selection responsibilities will be on our own to hire. It'll still be a civil service system, but we need to make sure that everyone understands what their roles and responsibilities are. What is OHR's role? What are the individual unit HR folks' roles? What are managers and supervisors' roles? So we need, we need to explicitly identify how this new process is going to work and what the roles are of everyone who's involved. Key business requirements for an applicant tracking system, an online application system, will no longer be using WISC jobs, which is the state government portal application for, for job applications. So we will be developing um, our own, and right now we're identifying those business requirements so that we can design and implement this new system. Developing um, policies regarding criteria for recruitment waivers. In the HR design strategic plan, we identified several areas where we can deviate from the normal recruitment process. One would be to limit applicants to internal candidates, those who, who already are University of Wisconsin-Madison employees, including LTEs and, and project appointees. So we need to specify the criteria that would apply in those cases as well as some specific cases where units can make direct hires without any competition. So we need to specify and put in place processes to get approvals to use those kinds of hiring flexibilities. And also, we've got uh, a series of, of non-exempt hourly uh, positions where we hire a lot of people, um, for example, custodians. So we need to figure out what the process is going to be since we'll no longer do that hiring through the state government um, process. So do we do that centrally through OHR? There's some argument for that. Or do we do it decentrally and allow each unit um, to hire um, its own or, or go through the recruiting and hiring process on its own even though they're hiring into similar positions as other units have? We need to figure that out in a way that is efficient and effective but also gives the individual hiring units the, um, the authority and the flexibility that they need and want. And then we, we're developing a procedure for blue collar transfers um, that will include a seniority provision. That was one of the changes we made to the draft uh, uh, plan that is included in the final plan, that there will be a provision to recognize seniority in blue collar transfers. So that's what we're doing on the hiring front. Diversity, inclusion, employee engagement. Um, 
there was a set, there is a section of the HR design strategic plan that addresses diversity on its own, but we also asked the diversity work team to take a look at the other 10 areas and identify recommendations to maintain and improve diversity. What has happened since we issued the report is the campus has assembled an ad hoc diversity committee that right now, literally as we speak, this ad hoc committee is meeting. I'm, I'm a member of the committee, but I'm here instead. The committee started meeting about a month ago, and its charge is to make recommendations for a campus-wide diversity plan. What the diversity work team found as part of the HR design work is that there's a lot of work going on around diversity on this campus, but much of it focuses exclusively on students and is uncoordinated. So this ad hoc diversity committee, its charge is to develop a single diversity plan focusing on, on the business case for diversity, including not just students, but also our workforce. And that plan will be presented to the campus sometime this spring. We also, in the divisions that report to Daryl Bazell, the Vice Chancellor for Finance and Administration, piloted an employee engagement and inclusion survey. We administered it to 4,500 employees. Right now, each of the 14 divisions that report to Daryl are analyzing the data and putting together action plans. This is the kind of thing we want to roll out um, to the entire campus so that we are systematically and regularly collecting data on our employees' perceptions of their engagement, the extent to which there is a, a positive climate, and efforts to achieve inclusion and diversity are working. So those are um, some, of the, some of the things that will be occurring over the next couple of years, including starting with the recommendations of the Ad Hoc Diversity Committee. Fostering and Managing Talent, Developing Supervisory Training Modules, specifically initially for the changes that are occurring in July. The Office of Human Resource Development within OHR is developing these training programs right now. In many cases, they are expansions of training programs that already exist, and those new training programs will be rolled out in advance of the July 1st um, start of our new HR system. One of the things that we're experiencing in OHRD is increased demand by managers and supervisors for the existing training programs. And we think that's a good sign. We think that we have, through this process, raised the awareness that managers and supervisors need to be focusing on dealing in a positive, constructive, and candid way with, um, with their employees to make sure, as I've mentioned several times and will again, that everybody understands what their role is and how their work contributes to the mission of the university. So we'll roll out additional training. We're also continuing to do research around performance management strategies to provide managers with a toolkit to make sure <clears throat> that they are prepared and equipped to work effectively with the people who report to them. So let's talk about what we're going to be putting in place on July 1st, 2013 to try to sum it up. The transitional compensation structure, which again will look a lot like, particularly for classified employees, well, not just for classified, for everyone, will look a lot like the current compensation system, but will have additional flexibilities and will be begin to eliminate any um, discrepancies between how we compensate our employees across employee groups. I don't mean discrepancies in terms of how much we pay people, but the mechanisms that we have for compensating our employees. So well, that'll be in place on July 1st. We'll transition the classified staff to university staff, um, basically a name change. Establish university staff governance. I explained the process we're going through right now to put that new structure in place. We'll have new appeals, grievance, and layoff processes to replace those processes that are currently governed by the Office of State Employment Relations. And we'll put in place new university staff recruiting and hiring um, processes. There will also be um, some implications for unclassified staff, but initially, because we'll no longer be governed by OSER, we have to have our own recruiting and hiring processes in place for university staff as of July 1st, 2013. Afterwards, over time, additional professional development, including more training um, for supervisors, will continue to do that. More effective performance management processes. Our vision 
and we included it in the HR design strategic plan, was to have, is to have, a standard performance management, performance evaluation process across the campus. Not necessarily the same performance evaluation form, but to make sure that every employee on this campus has an opportunity to sit down with their supervisor at the beginning of the year to make sure that there is agreement on what that employee's roles and responsibilities are. There is a mid-year check-in and there is an end-of-year performance evaluation. And it's not really about the piece of paper, it's about the conversation between the manager, supervisor, and the employee. It is our long-term goal to put in place that kind of process across the campus. Provide a workplace flexibility toolkit. The workplace flexibility team, work team, found that there's actually quite a lot of workplace flexibility going on across the campus in terms of schedules and, and days that you're in the office and the ability um, to work remotely, but it's not consistent and it's not consistently understood. So OHR will be creating a workplace flexibility toolkit to make sure that the entire campus understands what the options are, when and how they can be used, and how individual managers, supervisors, employees um, can access them. So in, in large part, it's an educational process, at least initially. Conduct this job title and total compensation analysis for academic and university staff. This is something we may do in cooperation and conjunction with UW System because they want to do it as well. And it will occur sometime after July 1st, 2013. This will be the first time we've done this in a very long time. It's going to be a very detailed process. We'll be collecting data from all of our employees to make sure we understand what everyone does so that we can put together a more um, coherent job title structure that has something less than 1,600 job titles, and we also understand where we need to be in the marketplace to be competitive for the best talent, continue to be competitive for the best talent. And that will um, result in a new title and compensation structure. So we now, I'm going to turn it back over to Harry, uh, but I do want to sum up by saying We've got, gotten a lot of work done over the last year and a half, as you saw in the slides about what needs to get done. We still have a lot of work to do. We will continue to have events like this, as well as other events like, uh, like web chats. We're also available to come to individual units and make these kinds of presentations. We'll continue to reach out to the campus to have the conversation about what this new system looks like. Um, up until now, We've had, I don't know, I've, I've even lost track, 50, 60, 70 different events involving about 10,000 employees. So we're going to work, continue work very hard, as we have done over the last year and a half, to make sure that everyone who wants to know what we're doing has not only the opportunity to understand what we're doing, but also the opportunity to weigh in on what we're doing. Eric? So as people arrive, might want to ask, we, we have a couple of different ways of inviting those questions. One is that we pass out cards, we'll index cards. If you've written down a question that you'd like to be, uh, at least in our record, if not having a chance to answer it this morning, uh, please pass that uh, to the middle here, and uh, we'll collect those, and then uh, we'll also then try and identify some questions that seem to be coming up on a recurring basis and make sure they get asked. But all questions and comments will be taken and we'll make sure we're, we're receiving those. So if you can pass those into the middle here and then the chair's going to walk up the middle and collect those. So that's one way that we'll be getting questions from people's cards. Uh, but in addition, uh, we want to be able to welcome questions from the floor. And we have uh, two microphones here, one that uh, David has and one that Catherine has, if anybody wants to ask a question from the floor. David? There's somebody right here. When we were having all the meetings earlier, uh, we heard some real horror stories about supervisors not giving out like performance reviews for 15 years to people. I, I see you have the, the performance management process. Is there going to be something there that's really going to hold us supervisors, hold our feet to the fire, to make sure we actually give those reviews to our people? That is our goal. Now, when I've, I've been here two and a half years, so I'm still trying to figure this place out. But one of the things I have learned is it's difficult to mandate 
to everybody on this campus what they ought to be doing. But we heard the same stories. And that is, I think it's outrageous that an employee could go for years on end and not have a performance appraisal. Um, the original strategic design plan called for what I just outlined, three conversations every year with every employee. We still make a strong statement in the HR design strategic plan that that needs to be done on, on a regular basis. But you're right. There has to be accountability. It has to start from the top. And we've, we've, we've told the, um, the chancellor, the provost, and the vice chancellor for finance and administration that if we're going to fix that problem, it needs to start at the top. And they need to do it themselves, and my boss does, Daryl Bazell, and they also need to make the people who report to them accountable for doing it. So is it, so someone asked me a question during one of the um, sessions, what am I going to do on July 1st, 2013, to make sure that everybody does all this stuff? And I still haven't figured out what we're going to do to make sure that everybody does everything we want them to do. It's going to take some time. It's not just about creating new policies and procedures. It's about a cultural change. So I'm giving you a long answer to a short question. It isn't going to happen overnight, but we are committed to making sure that the leadership of this campus understands that that's a problem and that we need to deal with it um, uh, from the standpoint of accountability and cultural change. And, and, and Bob, if, if, if you're hearing of situations where someone hasn't gotten a performance evaluation in years, you let us know and we will try to deal with that unit as well. And Bob, just to add one point too, this is supporting uh, this kind of performance management and feedback in all employee areas. So faculty senate have supported is, this, that, academic staff assembly have supported it, so it's, it's for all employees. And, and that includes then having some areas where it's not been part of the routine. Yeah, and, and I'll be, I'll that's be, be even a more explicit. Change. Harry's finessing this. It includes making sure that faculty understand that they are managers and supervisors as well. Now that's, um, we've had several conversations about that and uh, for, to some of them it's going to be a tough sell, but the reality is that many of the people who um, perform work on this campus are supervised by faculty and um, everyone needs to, to do the right thing. Yes, sir. Uh, when the uh, compensation and benefits survey is completed, yeah. who makes the final decision on, on those? when the survey comes in, who, who says, okay, yes, this is what these people are going to be paid, this is what these people are going to be paid. And once that's in place, who makes the decision on changing it in the future? Who makes it? I, 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 on changing compensation schedules in the future. Yeah. You know, that, after that, we set that, you know, is it going to be just one person that decides, yes, this person or each manager is going to decide what their people make? I, well, let me ask your first question, answer your first question first who's going to decide on this new compensation structure. There are going to be recommendations that are going to be made as a result of, of this study. Um, we'll have a campus-wide conversation. All of the governance groups, as part of their um, approval or acceptance of the HR design plan, uh, they included a proviso that they be involved in those conversations. So just as we did with HR design, we'll be talking to all the governance groups, and that includes the university, the new university staff governance groups. But, but at the end of the day, my expectation is that the chancellor, the provost, and the vice chancellor for finance and administration will make final decisions on what this new compensation structure looks like. Now, as we implement it, part of the proposal is going to be, I think, the second part of your question, who makes frontline decisions on how much individual employees get paid? There are going to be aspects of this that are going to apply to everybody. There's going to be an across-the-board provision. But there are also going to be um, some market-based adjustments that OHR will be involved in. There are going to be some performance-based adjustments that individual managers and supervisors um, will likely have the authority to make within the criteria that we're going to set up. So it's, it's, it's going to be a complicated process doing the study, having the conversation about the recommendations, and then making final decisions. The question is unions, unions that are recertified, and we have about, about 200 employees, primarily in the trades. We will be negotiating directly with those employees as a university. Right now, we don't negotiate directly. It's done by the Office of State Employment Relations, and that's the situation until July 1st, after which we, as a university, will negotiate directly with certified bargaining units, but 
will also be under the provisions of state law, which drastically, as you know, limit the scope of bargaining. So we'll be bargaining with certified units, but it will have to be within the parameters of state law. So state law changes, and we go back to a system where we're negotiating over a larger scope of issues than we will negotiate over, those, over that larger scope of issues. Hello, I work in an academic department and we've had two chairs in a row now that are clearly abdicating their faculty supervisor responsibilities. They refuse to give the department administrator a performance review when we have actually dealt with, had conversations with our chair about issues we've had with the department administrator. They have refused to directly address those issues. And now it seems that the university is saying that we're going to mandate, mandate that faculty go to training. Well, what happens when they come back and they still don't want to do their job? You know, again, if I had a magic answer to how we can make sure that everybody does what they're supposed to be doing, I would have talked about it two and a half years ago when I started. I don't have the answer. Part of it is training. We've talked with um, the university committee about training, and we've had several conversations about how to deliver that training in a way um, that will actually have faculty members attend the training. It is a question of accountability, and we'll, uh, even now we're happy to talk to you offline about your situation and see if there's anything we can do to intervene. But it's going to take time, it's going to take leadership, and it's going to mm -hmm. take accountability, and I don't have um, a quick answer. Yeah. So I have a question, I have a, actually a couple of questions here that are really related to the impact of changing from university, sorry, from university staff to academic staff. And there's some concerns about how people will be compensated. There's some concerns about how the information will be posted. Mm -hmm. uh, you, so I know that you were alluding to counseling, et cetera. Uh, maybe we need to clarify just what's going to happen that way. Okay, sure. Um, we will identify every employee who will have the option to move from university staff to academic staff. We will offer to sit down one-on-one -on -one with each of those employees and discuss each aspect of what that change could mean to them in terms of uh, compensation, in terms of job security, in terms of collective uh, bargaining, in terms of benefits, including leave. And We'll make sure that everyone understands to the extent that we can how switching from university staff to academic staff will affect them in the short term and also in the long term. And after we've had that discussion, the individual employee will have the opportunity to make a decision. And if they don't want to move, they won't have to. If they don't want to move then but may want to consider it later, um, they can do that. At the moment, we're considering that this choice period will be open-ended. It will kick off at a certain moment in time, but then it will be open-ended. So there isn't any pressure on anybody um, to move or not move. We see, we understand that the movement of these positions into the academic staff won't occur for many years because there are going to be employees who don't want to move, and we won't move those positions until um, they leave those positions. So it might be 20 or 25 years before all these positions move into the academic staff. But we made that decision intentionally because we don't want to be seen as forcing anybody, anyone, anybody, to do anything. So the counseling, and we need to be prepared for that counseling, which is why we're saying it isn't going to happen on July 1st, 2013. We need to make sure we understand all the implications. We think we do. Um, we also need to make sure that we have the correct data so that when we sit down with an employee and say you have X numbers of annual leave and Y uh, uh, of sick leave and if you move into the academic staff that's going to change and this is how it's going to change. So we need to make sure that we're prepared to do that and we won't begin these counseling sessions until we are. There's a related question that has to do with employee movement. Uh -huh. So, it's, and it's, I'll just read it the way it's asked. 
Is okay. it true that if a classified exempt employee who chooses to be an exempt university staff person, they have no hope of moving to any other position without having to become academic staff and ultimately losing benefits? Are you concerned about the staff you may lose over this? I'm always concerned about the staff we might lose over, over anything. I'm going to ask Mark to address that because he's been quite involved in those, when should, can you go to the mic, those discussions. Uh, yes, I'm Mark Walters, and yes, that issue has come up a great deal in regard to people feeling like they'd be pigeonholed if they, the only way that they could uh, take n another position uh, that was similar to what they're doing now, and if that vacancy is going to be academic staff, they are going to have to make a decision on whether they move from that university staff exempt position to that other position that is academic staff that will have all the benefits and everything else associated with academic staff. And so that is, that is the case, that the employees will have to make that decision. And if they want to move to that academic staff position, they're going to have to accept all the things that come along with the academic staff. Now, certainly it's our hope that down the road the issues, the differences between academic staff and the university staff as far as benefits, which is where the area that we hear primarily as far as the issue, that those become somewhat normalized as far as having one benefit structure across all of those uh, employment groups that are, that, are, that are the same, then that uh, would become less of an issue. I want to ask this question on Mark's up here too because it taps his expertise. So someone is, uh, has been 34 years of service, plans to retire in August at the age of 55, is there any talk of changing the early out that's at 55 to the mandatory age of 57? And what's going to happen to Schick? We, there has been no discussion about changing the, the age of 55 as, it, as far as people being able to, uh, to, to retire. Uh, we still will be covered by all the provisions of the employee trust funds, just like all other state employees. And so I have not heard any, but any discussion about changing uh, moving the 55 to 57 as far as the, f the first window for people to retire. And as far as the supplemental health insurance credit conversion, I have not heard any changes. We're certainly going to make sure our new HR system hooks into the SHIC program just like it does today. And so there will be no changes as far as what we're putting forward in, in regard to SHIC. Um, so I have my query reporting hat on now. <clears throat> it sounds like the classified exempt is going to be a two-stage process. On July 1st, all of them will be moved to university staff. And then in the fall, you'll have counseling sessions, and they can choose whether they want to become academic staff or not. That's right. For those employees who are exempt, currently exempt classified, that's okay. correct. And on July 1st, it'll be, it'll be merely a change in how, what we call those staff from classified to university. However, after July 1st, 2013, as those exempt positions become vacant, we will move them into the academic staff, even but, if it's before the choice period. But a person that chooses to go to academic staff will have two-step transition. Um, yeah, I guess you could say that. Okay. And the academic staff title is not going to change. I had heard that the wording is going to change. The academic that. staff titles, well, we, we're move, the, we need to move some of the titles that are currently in the classified service into the academic staff. What uh, I mean, the upper class academic staff is not going to change. Correct. That will okay. not change. Thank you. You're welcome. Just for some clarification, do you know what uh, comp time and overtime is going to look like for classified exempt staff once they switch to university staff? And then um, at the end, if they choose to move to academic staff? No overtime for academic staff. There, the question is overtime for academic staff? Correct. Uh, no, uh, overtime and comp time that uh, exempt classified staff get currently. Well, uh, the, the HR design plan calls for us to eliminate overtime for exempt staff with um, a carve out for the police because the standard practice in that um, community, not just here but in general, is to provide overtime. But other than that, the plan calls for us to eliminate overtime for classified exempt employees. There will be other flexibilities around compensation um, to reward people who have to put in extra hours, but um, exempt overtime is not going to be one of them. So here's a question, Bob, that 
summarizes a whole set of questions. Will vacation, personal time, and sabbatical change for classified staff on July 1st when classified staff become university staff? Let me be real clear about this. No. There was, uh, in the original HR design work team recommendations, as I mentioned earlier, recommendations about integrating the benefits programs that are currently different between classified and unclassified into a single system, but that became very complex, very controversial, and uh, a, a, an assessment of our benefits programs will be included in the total compensation study. Um, but other than the three things I mentioned earlier um, about vacation time, income, uh, not income continuation, catastrophic leave, and first day health insurance pickup, um, benefits are not going to change as of July 1st, 2013. Yeah, we, oh, no, sorry. we have a question over there. Can you clarify when the counseling sessions will begin for classified staff? Can you Cla clarify when the counseling sessions will begin? I don't know yet. Sometime after July 1st. We're still figuring that out. But it, it, they will begin um, in plenty of time for people to make an informed decision. That's why, we're, that's why we're saying the choice period will not begin on July 1st, 2013, because we'd have to start the counseling sessions now. We're not ready to do that yet. This is a different kind of question. It's related to our alignment with HRS and alignment with UW system. How is this all going to work with HRS processing, and will the system be aligned with UW system? Um, two separate questions. First of all, in terms of alignment with UW System, we have been meeting with UW System almost from the very beginning of this process, and we have identified specific areas where we need to be in alignment, um, like employee categories, like benefits programs, but there are large, there's a wide range of things where we don't have to be in alignment, like, uh, like uh, compensation and uh, training and performance management. So we've identified those areas where we need to be in alignment and their recommendations are similar to ours in those areas. So we'll, we'll be a separate system, um, but in order to provide opportunities for mobility and, and uh, for other reasons, there are some areas where we are going to be in alignment. In terms of HRS, we've also been meeting with the HRS folks regularly over the past several months to make sure that they understand what changes need to be made starting on July 1st when we change the, uh, the designation of classified employees to university staff employees, make sure they understand the choice process that's going to occur sometime after July 1st, 2013, make sure they understand what changes, and we understand what changes need to be made to HRS. So that is a continuing um, conversation which will continue as early as this afternoon when we have our next meeting with them. Not, no waiting on that, right? No, that's right. Okay. Um, Serendipity. So one of the things that, that goes on is that sometimes department supervisors are stuck with rules that they feel don't allow them to really retain talent, retain people who really work well together. Sure. And so this question is, will department supervisors have tools to uh, create and retain a group of office staff that work well together and want to remain in their position in department? That's uh, a hard question to have, have. I mean, they have, they have tools right now. We're talking about comp if we're talking about compensation tools, we are going to be introducing compensation flexibility so that, as I mentioned earlier, we can bring people in to the university and not be limited to just paying at the, the base level of the pay range and also provide flexibility um, to reward good performers or teams of good performers. So there is going to be that additional flexibility. And if the issue is around compensation flexibility, yeah. We, we know that one of the challenges on this campus right now is, particularly with classified staff, sometimes the only way to get a pay raise is to transfer into another position. We want to, um, we want to make, um, we want to eliminate that as the only option and level the playing field so that you don't have to transfer. That's the only way to get a pay raise, so that the home unit can also um, be competitive and not have to lose employees because they are, are not competitive in terms of compensation. Okay. You have a question back there? Yeah. 
Are any compensation slash benefit packages going to be changed as of July 1st? Well, uh, the, the only benefits changes will be the three areas that I talked about. Um, there'll be a single uh, catastrophic leave program. University staff, now classified staff employees, will be able to take their vacation, their annual leave during their first six months. And we hope to get legislative approval to provide um, first day employer health insurance pickup. So those are the only three benefits changes um, that will occur. In the area of compensation, we're gonna provide additional compensation flexibility. So yeah, that will um, enable managers and supervisors to have greater flexibility, like I said, to, to hire people at um, uh, higher than the minimum and also to um, provide market and performance-based compensation. Now, one area that will change is we will be paying all of our employees a living wage as computed by the city of Madison. Right now, we have around, what, 1,000? 1,000 employees who are paid less than the city of Madison living wage because we can't increase their salary because you don't have the authority to do that. Those, sa those, those pay rates are fixed and determined by the Office of State Employment Relations. So as of July 1st, it is our intention to raise the pay of those employees to the living wage level, which would be, what will it be? 12.19 an hour. And we have people, we have about 1,000 people right now who make less than that. We're gonna fix that on July 1st. Okay. Um, here's a, a question. How long do you anticipate the, uh, the classification compensation study will take? It might take a year. That's uh, w when you look at the scope of this place, the number of employees, the number of job titles, um, it w it's not unrealistic that it could take a year and the amount of data that we have to collect. Have a question there? Yeah, I, I wanted to ask a question about a difference in, uh, I guess it would be a benefit between exempt and non-exempt. And it's a little more specific than I've been listening to. One of the, um, one of the, things I was curious about is in a pay period, if I were to uh, come in late and want to make up that time, I have to do it within the week that it occurred, whereas an exempt employee is allowed the two-week pay period to make it up. Has that specifically been addressed? Mark? Well, the, the issue Why don't you go to the mic? Mark. The, the issue really with that is the Fair Labor Standards Act, because when you're non-exempt, uh, you get paid for the, the hours you work during that week. So if you were to make up the hours, let's say, the next week, then you'd, have, uh, you'd, be, forced, you'd be forced into an overtime situation. So the, the ability to make up the time during that week uh, is, is where you don't get forced into that overtime issue. And so the, the exempt employees, they're paid by a total job concept, not governed by the Fair Labor Standards Act as far as how many hours that they work. So that really, that, that really is an issue about the Fair Labor Standards Act as far as how employees can make up that time. Now, a lot of creative supervisors on campus have found ways to address those things. Uh, certainly, if, if there's some issues that begin, occur in the beginning of the week, then trying to make up that time during the week. But it's really the 40-hour standard for the Fair Labor Standards Act that doesn't allow for the makeup in the following week without the employee being placed in, over, in an overtime status, which certainly becomes an issue. So one, one question has to do with uh, layoff and, and the question is why do we have a loophole for layoff such as exemptions to seniority? I'm just reading the question. Well, I, I, this goes to a point that I made earlier. We're, we're trying to balance management flexibility with maintaining job security. And the work team, and, and we agreed, um, recommended that while seniority needs to be the default, the primary consideration, there can be situations where other factors like critical skills should come into play. So we accepted that recommendation, included it in the, um, in the HR design strategic plan with the proviso that any exceptions to seniority-based layoffs would have to be approved by OHR and we would also issue criteria around how that process would work. So um, we feel that, it, that is a balance between giving 
work units the flexibility they need to maintain um, their operational capability as well as job security. So someone expresses a sentiment here that I think some others could express as well, which is, uh, I have not had a pay increase in several years and have seen more taken out of my che paycheck for the cost of benefits, health and retirement. Is there any plan in place for an across-the-board pay increase for classified employees in 2013? Well, this, uh, usually when a question like this is asked and Daryl Bazell is in the room, I ask him to stand up and reiterate that our job was to design a new compensation structure but not fund it. Um, but having said that, an important component of the new compensation flexibility will be across the board pay increases. We're hopeful, and don't take this to the bank, literally or figuratively, that there will be a pay plan next year and we will have the ability to do across the board pay increases because we recognize that there haven't been pay raises in a long time and at the same time increases in benefit contributions have really put a lot of our employees in, in tough spots. So we're, we, we will continue to have that capability. We've explicitly included it and even emphasized it in the rewritten HR design strategic plan and we're hopeful that there will be a pay plan. Question over there. Back to uh, compensation. So if you disagree with your uh, supervisor's uh, performance evaluation, which can affect your pay increase, will there be an appeal procedure for you to uh, appeal their decision? Don't know that yet, Gary. That's part of what we'll be um, working out over the next several months uh, in, in terms of, uh, of a grievance and appeals process. But certainly, we're going to have that conversation. Over there. I had a time not too long ago where I was a little bit late and asked a to make bit it up and was told I could not. I was told I had to use sick time. I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't, I'm sorry. Can you we please didn't hear. repeat the I question. Had a, I had a situation a little while ago where I was a little bit late, like nine minutes, I think it was, uh -huh. and was told I could not make the time up. I had to use sick time. I don't know. Did you hear that? Nine minutes late. Was told she had to use sick time. Couldn't make it up. Those types of issues are really uh, um, governed at the local level as far as the college or schools and divisions and, and without knowing the details as far as uh, what division that you are a part of, uh, I could not, I, I can't give you much detail on that, uh, but I, I would suggest that uh, having discussions with your HR representative about that to see as far as how to, to proceed in the future. Uh, or after this forum, we certainly can talk about it and I can get more details and, and, and see if we can resolve that issue. I have a specific question, Steve, related to uh, nurse clinician twos and threes. Where do they fit in here? Is there? Uh, nurse clinicians. And, and you are? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Steve Lund from the Academic Personnel Office. Hello. Um, <laughs> by the way, I've been here almost 33 years, and I'm still trying to figure the place out as well. Great. Um, nurse clinician. So this is part of what Bob was saying, is that we're, we're looking at mapping the, the, all the classified exempt titles, of which nurse clinician is one, into ac either academic staff titles that currently exist, or if they don't, such as chemist, then we will uh, create a new title. Don't have the final answer to that, but uh, very possibly nurse clinicians could go into the clinical nurse specialist. Is that the title? Did I get that right? Okay, good. Um, the clinical nurse specialist title in the academic staff, but that hasn't been uh, a final decision. See, I knew you could handle that question. Um, wh there's a question about the individual meetings and the counseling here. Sure. Um, so who's going to be providing them uh, if it's not taking place in the fa fall, or uh, then people are able to change uh, what's their decision going to be based on? OHR will provide the counseling. And the, the open period for change, um, we will make sure that people have the counseling sessions. So. If we announce, I'm making this up, on September 1st, 2013, the open period commences, that doesn't mean you have to make a decision on September 1st. That just means that starting on September 1st, 
you can make a decision, but we won't, we won't um, start the open period unless and until we're prepared to provide that kind of one-on-one -on -one counseling. And ideally, we'd like to do it even before the open period begins. So one thing I want to make sure everyone is aware of is that on the HR Design website, there are the, some brief uh, pieces that have been put up there in the last couple of months related to explaining some things about HR that are important to understand. And we'll be adding to that. So by getting your questions here, we're also understanding more specifically where people need more information and, and make sure that it's up on that website and, as well as in these sessions. And believe me, we recognize how big a decision this will be. And we don't want to start that process unless we and everyone involved is fully prepared to make the decision. So um, again, that's why we originally thought that we would be in a position to do that on July 1st, 2013, but now we know that we won't. And that's one of the things that doesn't have to happen on July 1st, 2013. So it isn't going to happen until everyone's ready. Question over here? Yeah, just me, Bob. Hey, Terry. How you I, doing? I got a couple. Uh, I'm shocked. Yeah. Well, I was, I was listening to you say we didn't want to pigeonhole anyone, let, yet you changed the transfer rights and eliminated the right to come back to your job. So if you want to transfer as a custodian from housing to Memorial Union, you find out it's a bad fit. You could have 20 years, you're out of a job. So how much more can you pigeonhole someone than that? Uh, the one HR system. So uh, do, you, do you want me to answer that or you want to just? Well, I, I can go through and then okay. you can. Yeah, uh, the one HR system, does that, right now we have two and maybe three, does that mean we're going to eliminate the HR system for the classified non-exempt or how are we going to fit that in? And I don't think that's a very good idea. Uh, Okay, okay. Yeah, let me, add, let me clarify on the first one, Terry. Thank you for bringing that up. The, the HR strategic design plan does call for a 30-day right of return. So we've, elim we've, we've eliminated or reduced the six-month to 30-day. And let me explain a little bit of the thinking behind um, reducing it. We know that many units leave those positions open when they lose an employee because if they rehire somebody, if they hire somebody into that position and the employee comes back, they're going to be stuck. And we think that places an unfair burden on the losing unit, particularly since the employee made a conscious decision to transfer. So originally, as you point out, the HR Design Strategic Plan called for that right of return to be completely eliminated. After a lot of conversation, including um, with uh, our labor folks, the plan was changed to provide a 30-day right of return, which we think gives the employee enough time to figure out if it is a bad fit, and if it is, they can go back, but it doesn't place an undue strain on the, uh, uh, on the losing unit to keep that position open for six months. And some, some of these uh, different departments have put more draconian rules on it than that we brought up to Patrick Sheehan. Now, the sec you asked, yeah. asked the second question also yeah. about... And I want to come to another question that's down here. ...about integrating um, the system. To, can, can you ask that question again, Terry, please? Uh, if we're going to one system, right yeah. now we have two and then the trades, yep. which is actually three. Yep. If we go to one, does that mean, as everybody's worried, is that going to mean that we're all going to be shoved into one compensation package again because there's only going to be one HR system? Right. And, and there's a lot of people here with a lot of years sure. who are we going to lose time? And if we go to that... Do we lose some of the autonomy that we've been able to talk about? It almost sounds like it's union busting when you start talking about we're going to take one of these away, the I, one that I, we I, deal I, with. I, I, uh, I couldn't disagree more with the characterization that anything we're doing is union busting. So I want to go on, on record as that, uh, saying that um, we will continue, as we have even after Act 10, to work with our labor partners. If there, um, if there are certified bargaining units, as I mentioned earlier, we will continue to bargain with them up to the limits that state law allows us to do that. Now, in terms of combining these systems into one, particularly a compensation system, that doesn't mean, even if we eventually go to a single compensation system, it will have different components. We were very explicit in the HR design plan that um, different um, uh, occupations, different segments of our workforce are going to require different compensation approaches. There are a lot of people who work in jobs where it probably is hard to differentiate performance. So the focus there is probably going to be across the board 
and market-based compensation, and less so on performance. So even if we go to a single compensation system, we will build in enough flexibility to, um, to meet the needs of our individual em employee groups. And, and I, I thought we were pretty, um, pretty explicit about that, that mm -hmm. there is no one-size-fits-all compensation solution. We have 1,600 job titles. We've got probably the most diverse workforce in this state. And we can't adopt a single compensation approach to meet the needs of all those employees, and we won't do that. So as we've come to 11 o'clock, Catherine, you have a question, and I have one more that I want to make sure to ask her. When you were talking about the hypothetical September 1st and the counseling session starting, once a decision is made, will things go have to be um, retroactively back to July 1st then, if no, anything no, changes? No, it'll, it'll, it'll occur um, effective when the employee makes a decision. And the decision, on, in my hypothetical example, it was we would open that decision period on September 1st, but it would be open-ended. So you could, you could decide on September 1st to move, you could decide not to move, or you could decide later to move. So the, this last question uh, resonates with a theme that's been here about accountability. Who holds the managers and supervisors accountable? What are the criteria? And then, of course, it relates back to the faculty. Accountable for what? Accountable for doing effective performance management and the things that we're, we're putting into place. And, of course, it related to faculty as well. Well, in my unit, I hold my managers accountable for effective performance management, uh, coaching, counseling, um, performance evaluations, and we keep track of the extent to which that is done. Um, it is going to be up to leadership to make individual managers and supervisors accountable um, for doing that work and making sure that employees understand um, what their roles are. We are going to do training. But really, at the end of the day, it's about performance and productivity. You know, this is a research. This is, one of the, this is one of the world's great research institutions. All of the research that has been done shows that when employees understand their roles, understand the line of sight between what they do and the mission of the organization, understand their goals and expectations, they perform better. So we need to make sure that managers and supervisors understand that it's not just the right thing to do, which it is, but it also will help them and their units perform better. But there has to be, there has to be accountability, and there also has to be a way for us to maintain data on the extent to which these conversations are taking place, like we're doing right now in the Office of Human Resources. So we hope that we can implement a system that will allow us to track the extent to which those events are taking place. But it's not going to happen overnight. As I mentioned earlier, it's not just about new policies and procedures. It's about accountability, leadership, and culture change. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And stay tuned. hrdesign.wisc.edu. Right. We'll be posting additional and information. And please let coworkers uh, know about the session at Gordon Commons tomorrow afternoon and on Wednesday late night at the Health Sciences Learning Center. Yeah, you can come again to the midnight session. <laughs>